Chris Hummer, 247 Sports College Football Writer. Also follows the transfer portal and does a great job with the sport itself. Chris Hummer joins Craig Smoke, Paul Catalina. I'm David Smoke, 365 Sports. Chris, thank you very, very much for being a part of the show. So you kind of caught my attention with East Carolina cornerback Siobhan Ravel. Uh, he got a 350000 or more uh, offer to enter the portal, which to me immediately, Chris, and we know this is happening, means that somebody contacted him before he was actually supposed to be contacted, correct? Yeah, um, I do tell a lot of the story, kind of what it's like behind the scenes when uh, tampering occurs and kind of what that looks like um, and kind of the pressure that family was under. So, yeah, absolutely. A lot of, a lot of schools reaching out ahead of time. So what ultimately brought him back to East Carolina? I, the word he used most was loyalty. Um, and I, I know that kind of uh, may ring hollow for some people in this era of college football. Um, and I mean, I, I really don't think many people would have turned down the money he did. And shoot, I probably wouldn't have either. But um, he's the type of player who I think is trying to look at it from a bigger picture. Uh, for one, like the East Carolina staff was the first one to offer him out of JUCO. His GPA wasn't very good in high school. Really wasn't very good in JUCO when he first got there. And they believed in him early and worked with him and helped him um, get to East Carolina in the first place. And now um, they were also the school that developed him. Um, their new cornerback, their cornerbacks coach, Jules Monatar, who uh, arrived there last year, really helped unlock him. Um, this was really the first time in 2023 he played college football. He played very sparingly in 2022. And I think he saw the development he had under that coaching staff, and he wanted to stick around. Chris, uh, I, I think we'd all love to be pursued by people wanting to throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at us, but it can also be a, a little bit of a pain as well. Just how much of a pain do you get the sense from uh, Ravel or, or others that you've talked to of – uh, this process, like, sure, there's the benefit, the gold at the end of the rainbow, so to speak, but how stressful are we talking in some cases for some of these players? Yeah, it's got to be exhausting. Um, not just exhausting, but, like, you're – I feel like a decade ago, like, in college football, you showed up on campus and your next five years were laid out ahead of you. Um, you knew what you had to do. Like, you beat out the person in front of you, play as much as you can, you go to the NFL – um, now these players have a lot more options, but I think it comes with added pressure and added stressors. Like it's, it's really hard. I would imagine. And I mean, I would, I would know nothing about it, but I'm sure it's really hard at 21 or 22 or even 19 to have hundreds of thousands of dollars thrown in your face. Not only, not by one school in a lot of cases, but by multiple and going through that decision making process and having outside actors put pressure on you and in some cases even having your family put pressure on you because that's life-changing money um so it's it's got to be a lot and then on top of that chris you're not just talking about once in january when the portal opened up but yet again in april correct that they had to go through it the family the player who of course that was good news for him that he was wanted like that but then east carolina staff so even if you dodged the bullet after the season you still had that april bullet right yeah, 100%. Um, it's funny. Uh, his family actually pulled a – Siobhan and his family actually pulled an April Fool's prank on ECU coaching staff telling them they're entering the portal. Um, and they weren't going to at that time, obviously, but the portal didn't open until April 16th. And the 16th to the 30th, 30th is a lot of time. There's a lot, of, a lot of schools come calling. You have to basically battle that every single day. Um, if you're the ECU coaching staff and that's what they had to do. Um, they battled to keep him. They had to re-recruit him every day. They had to make things seem as normal as possible. So yeah, it's a very nerve wracking 14 days for that coaching staff. Chris, there's, um, not been anybody to like majorly call out anyone yet because it's a, it's a, a dangerous thing. You could be a coach on a G5 roster that uh, and says, like, listen, we don't tamper, we don't do this. But if you got one coach that tampered and you didn't know about it, um, then you're going to be caught in, in a hypocrisy. Uh, there's really nothing that they'll – I can't imagine anything they'll come up with that will, outside of collective bargaining and contracts, rein any kind of interference in. 
Yeah, absolutely not. Um, I think nothing short of buyout clauses or I guess something similar to like European football that you would see where um, essentially there's a transfer fee uh, for these players uh, would really, and I mean, that probably wouldn't stop it, but it would at least give um, some of the smaller schools a win in these cases. So, yeah. Um, until we have until we have full fledged contracts, and until there's some form of, I would imagine some form of representation for these athletes in terms of a union, like it's going to be very hard to stop any of this stuff. It's just, I mean, like this is college football, y'all. Like the fabric of the sport is cheating. Cheating has long been right. <laughs> or, or, like cheating. Cheating has long been part of the sport, and um, it's a very competitive competitive marketplace and teams do anything they can do to get ahead yeah I, I, Chris I, I I'm so glad you said that because sometimes I have to remind myself and sometimes remind everybody of like what, what are we really getting our, our panties in a bunch over somebody maybe cheating in college football like what are we talking about it's like the entire it's ingrained in the fabric of the sport to your point um, but so is getting excited about lists and freshmen and, and things like that uh, so you put together a pretty thorough list of impact true freshmen a hundred players um, man, where did you start and, uh, how long did this take you and, and kind of where, where did it take you, uh, putting this list together? <laughs> well, it takes too long. I'll tell you that, <laughs> but, um, I'm happy with the, I'm happy with the product and yeah, it's just talking to, talking to a ton of people in college football. I, I usually go by team and the power four and try to get at least one guy on there from every school. In some cases it's not possible because not all schools are really in position to play freshmen. And especially at this point in the summer, like this list is like, I think it's interesting, but it's not going to be a true reflection of like, who's going to play a hundred percent because you don't know who's going to get injured. You also don't know who's going to come in during the summer and in fall camp and really um, exceed expectations. But um, we hope this list is a snapshot of kind of the freshmen who matter ahead of the 2024 season. And um, I, I think we got a hundred guys on there that are going to play and, I think some of them, like a Jeremiah Smith at Ohio State or a Cam Coleman at Auburn, like are going to do more than play. I think they're going to be legitimate stars from day one. Yeah, I was going to ask you about Jeremiah Smith. And there are hyped wide receivers. And then there's Jeremiah Smith. Because um, from all reports out of Ohio State Spring, he was um, – one of the two best receivers on the roster already. Uh, and he's just a different kind of animal. Would he? Would you say he falls maybe in that Adrian Peterson category of someone who's just so advanced uh, in spite of being so young? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's – I mean, I know I – know, I work for a company that does rankings, and I know not everybody believes, like, rankings are everything. But, like, Jeremiah Smith is the number one receiver – all time in 24 seven sports it's high school rankings mm. um so you're talking about i guess now almost 14 years of rankings he's the number one um and there just aren't a lot of receivers like him i, I saw him live at the all american bowl in san antonio and he made some high school cornerbacks look like junior like high school cornerbacks that are playing in the all american bowl so like some of the best high school cornerbacks in america look like they were ninth graders or eighth graders like it's just a different kind of dude he's 6'3", 215. Uh, he's got great long speed. He's like a sub. Like, an, he doesn't really run the 100, but, like, I think talking to people, he would be a sub-11 second guy. Um, he high points the football as well as anybody. He wins a ton of 50-50 balls. He's an av advanced route runner. Like, there's very little Jeremiah Smith can't do. Um, frankly, there was a bit of a bidding war for him at the last second, even in high school, between Miami and Ohio State um, because he's that special. Um, and yeah, I mean, you just mentioned he's the second best, one of the two best receivers on Ohio State's roster. That's a roster that's produced, I think, like five or six first round picks at receivers the last couple of years. Their top returning receiver is Emeka Abuka, who's probably a top five receiver in college football. And Jeremiah Smith was right there with him uh, during spring ball. So um, I really do think he is going to be a household name sooner rather than later. Not, it won't just be folks who follow recruiting uh, by the end of this year who know the name. I think he'll be one of the top receivers in the country. Do you feel the same about Cam Coleman? I feel like I've heard a, a ton about him and just his size and how impressive he is. Have you kind of gotten the same, I guess, response? He's he's on your list as well and very uh, highly rated. But um, as far as coming in and making an impact right away, is that what you expect down in Auburn? Yeah, people over there rave about him. Um, like, just – unfiltered raving about yeah. him and you usually see a little bit of caution 
with talking about first year guys. It's always a lot of qualifiers. Like if this goes right, like he has a chance, like there was none of that with him. Um, everybody, I think in that building expects him to come in and make an impact. I mean, Hugh Freeze has said it publicly. I think he said Cam Coleman changes us on offense. Like you don't, you don't say that about 18 year olds unless they really do. And like, he, he's that type of guy, this wide receiver class nationally, frankly, um, is one of the best we've seen in a very long time. Like a guy like Micah Hudson in this state in Texas, um, is going to have a huge year for Texas tech. Um, the people over there can't stop raving about him and, I think there's quite a few receivers this year from this class that are going to have a really big impact on this season. Um, the wide receiver, I mean, just because of the way college football is now, like wide receivers are um, a more pro- have a more prominent role and they're more ready to play than they've ever been before. And I think we'll, we'll see that this year. I was looking at not only the names, but the programs who have multiple players that could be top 100 freshmen. And I think Alabama right off the top had four. And there's a handful that have three, two, and, of course, a bunch who have one. Is that a compliment for what DeBoer was able to keep and add to have, I believe, I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, the four, and I don't know if anyone else has four impact freshmen, at least on this list? Well, I, I will say just like a quick clarification on this list. It's not really the top 100 freshmen. It's the 100 freshmen that – we think have the best chance of making an impact in 2024. Okay. So in some cases, like players might be, there might, there are better freshmen in some cases than the hundred on this list, but it's about path to the field playing time, right. general readiness in terms of size. And yeah, I, I does speak to Kalen DeBoer holding on to his class. Cause like he, there are four or five stars listed for Alabama here. Um, and one of them, especially Ryan Williams, the receiver, like looked at other schools, but ended up staying in the class. But it also speaks to just, like, what Alabama has holes at. Like, these fresh, like three tr- freshman cornerbacks didn't have a chance to play at Alabama under Nick Saban most of the time. But because of what they lost in the NFL draft and because of what they lost in the transfer portal, like, Alabama needs freshman cornerbacks to step up, which is why you see three of them on this list. And Xavier Brown, uh, the kid from California, um, was starting in the spring uh, already because of how thin they were at that position. So in a lot of cases, this is uh, not only a, not only a measure of talent, but it's a measure of need. And Alabama has a pretty significant need, especially in the secondary. Chris Hummer, 247 sports with us on 365 sports. Chris, Dylan Riola is the quarterback who probably has to make the biggest impact on this list because he is the likely starter at Nebraska. How, um, how advanced do you think he is? And do you think that he has, just because they're going to run a, a lot of power offense there at Nebraska with Matt Rule, are they going to maybe be able to protect him a little bit more? Uh, we'll see. Um, Dylan Rail is certainly talented, and uh, he is somebody who was a little up and down. And that sounds weird to say for, like, a five-star quarterback, but he had – his up and down moments in high school. Um, he was a lot better as a senior than he was as a junior, which you would expect, but he was a lot worse as a junior than he was as a sophomore. Um, and I mean, part of that is the fact that I think he was changing offenses in some cases and moving, but um, the early returns on him have been really positive. Uh, anybody watched Nebraska spring game? I think he went something like 16 for 23. Like he was really effective that day. And he is, he's going to be that guy. Um, Nebraska tried to take two quarterbacks. Um, they went heavily after a former Ohio state starter. I'm drawing a blank on his name. He's now at Syracuse. Um, but, uh, ultimately decided just to go with Dylan Rayola. Um, and that speaks to what they need him to do. And I think Matt rule is a good enough coach to protect him a little bit, as you said. Um, but I think, I mean, they're recruiting receivers at a really high level there. Um, they want that passing game to be more effective than it was last year. So I think a lot is going to be put on Dylan Rayola's plate. Like that offense was abhorrent last year in terms of the passing game. They were one of the worst in the country. And I think there's going to be at least somewhat of an expectation of Dylan Rayola um, to lift that group up. Um, he might not lead the big 10 in passing or come anywhere close to that, but they, they certainly need him to be above 2000 yards, which is, something none of their quarterbacks last year even came close to sniffing so um, I think he'll have a little bit on his plate how quickly we forget 11 and 1 Kyle McCord uh just yeah <laughs> yeah just... My, my bad my bad Kyle <laughs> a, lot, a lot of quarterback <laughs> up there. yeah uh, absolutely uh 
For Clemson, you two of the three guys you list are wide receivers. And while offensive line play has not been for them what it was during their glory days, this is their most glaring need. And Dabo obviously doubles down on this. You know, he lost Bo Collins, who was an okay receiver for them. Obviously, he wasn't, you know, this isn't a guy like Emeka Obuka or someone like that who has tons of stats in his corner, but he's decided to replace them with true freshmen. Those guys will likely have to play a role. Uh, and will I think the, will they be the furthest ones, like the ones that are, this is Dabo proving, I don't need the portal, I don't care what all the rest of you say? Yeah, we'll see. I, I just, I, I don't know if you can win in this era without the transfer portal, frankly. I just think it's hamstringing yourself in an unnecessary way. Like Achilles, like it was, bo- I mean, I don't mean to take this to like Greek mythology, but Achilles like literally was born with an Achilles heel. You know what I mean? <laughs> like Clemson is giving itself an Achilles heel um, in this situation. But the two receivers are really interesting because last year um, Clemson, I think ranked 128th nationally in air yards per throw. So they were just ahead of some of the Naval academies. And we talked about that in the context of tech transfers, but like, Kate Klubnik did not throw the ball downfield last year in large part because Clemson did not have the receivers who could stretch the field. And that's what these two guys, Bryant Wesco and TJ Moore can do. They're both outside receivers in the mold of Clemson's receivers of old. I think we all remember DeAndre Hopkins and Sammy Watkins and Martavius Bryant and Justin Ross and T Higgins. Clemson hasn't had that guy since 2021, essentially. And there is the hope that these two receivers can be that. So, if they can be in year one, um, I think that does help Dabo Sweeney prove his point that you don't have to dip it in the portal to be successful. Um, but at the same time, it is, it's really hard to expect that from 18 year old freshmen and Bryant Wesco, particularly like he's a Midlothian Texas kid. Like I've seen him live, like super talented, but a little more raw than some of the other top receivers in this class. So I'll be very curious how ready he is to go. Uh, come the fall. Chris, what is it like, uh, and one of the things you do, you write about everything in college football, but what is it like to try to manage or cover, managing the coverage of the transfer portal? Is that an everyday thing? Is it a time where you need to push away for a day or two, or can you even do that? Uh, It depends on the time of year. Um, December, like November, December, January, February, all portal, March, a little bit off April, May, April, May, definitely all portal. But this time of year, you kind of get to take a step back and do other things and cover other things. But um, in college football, I mean, in anything you cover what people care about. And right now people really care about the transfer portal. It's our crazy dumb version of free agency in college football. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you're right. All right. I got not putting you on the spot, but, a lot of conferences are coming out with the wins and losses, Vegas, et cetera, rankings. If you looked and glanced at the Big 12, which has got the 16 teams, you've got the new four, Texas, Oklahoma, gone. Is there a conversation in your head that would be Utah, Kansas State, or is somebody else you think that might be a part of that party at the top? I personally, like, I think you could – I mean, I think Utah is kind of its own – point of conversation in the big 12 um if cameron rising's healthy i think they are the favorite um but i really like you just mentioned a couple schools but i would also throw texas tech kansas ucf arizona oklahoma state iowa state (laughs) all like all of those teams i think have a legitimate chance to play in dallas uh for the big 12 championship like I, i just don't think there's a lot of separation i think it's a really interesting league i think it's a very good league but i don't think there's a team outside of utah really And maybe Kansas State, if Avery Johnson is who they hope that he is, that can really say it separates itself from anybody else. And I I really think you can go seven or eight deep in this league with teams that have a legitimate chance to make it to Dallas. Um, I just don't think there's a lot of separation. I don't either. All of us agree with you. We we could sit there and chew on this all day, and we probably will until we get about midway through the conference. It seems like it's the team that each year, and maybe this is the case elsewhere, there's like three wins or so that are bang bang games, like a feel like TCU two years ago, Baylor in 21, teams that somehow find a way to win those three games at the wire because they're not dominant, but they win those games. The next year it might fall differently. So it's great to hear you and, and kind of sink, 
you say the same thing that we've been talking about. Thanks for your time. Great stuff, Chris. Thanks for your time. Have a great rest of the week. Absolutely. Thanks, y'all. Chris Hummer, 247, spitting out a bunch of, I mean, mega information on the free.